When I reviewed City of Heroes, Champions Online, and to a far lesser extent DCUO, I was met with a fair share of certain critiques and understood that certain things came with the territory of superheroes and comics related media. It's a pretty passionate genre. So when I heard there was another superhero game on the horizon, I was more than a little wary about eventually having to look at it. Luckily, it turned out that game in question wasn't exactly what people would expect from an MMO, and I was easily able to write the game off as a side quest, with its simple playstyle and lack of personal creativity and control. However, I've been a bit lax with things I qualify for full episodes, and after the game I was perfectly happy to leave as a side quest began to show a little meat on its bones, but was still simple enough of a title to get in and play for a good while, I thought, eh, why the hell not? So, let's close out the current crop of superhero MMOs, at least until City of Titans is released. This is the MMO Grinder, and it's time to look at Marvel Heroes. Marvel Heroes, or as it's going by now, Marvel Heroes 2015, can... can anyone explain to me as to why? It's 2014 now. Is it going by the same logic that car companies use when rolling out the new models? Is it going to call itself Marvel Heroes 2016 next year? It's bugging me. I'm leaving the arbitrary year out. Okay, back on track. Marvel Heroes is a superhero-themed dungeon crawler very similar to the Diablo series, featuring gameplay where you blast through tons of enemies and pick up way more loot than you'll ever conceivably have room for. The Diablo series comparison isn't entirely unfair, by the way. The game was created by David Brevik, who worked on Diablo and Diablo 2. Hell, you'll find plenty of references to Diablo if you're savvy enough. There's even a place in the game known as the Bovine Sector. While I was originally content to relegate the game to side quest status, there have been a lot of updates to the game and there's much more to do now. As beta as the original version felt, so much so that I actually called it a beta in the video when it was technically at full launch, this updated version still retains a lot of the original design simplicity, but some of the new heroes have yet to receive their new reworks, so there's things being added and updated all the time. You can kind of see how meaningless the concepts of beta and launch are when it comes to MMOs. Well, let's begin. I like the look of this game for what it is. It's nicely rendered and very crisp and clean looking with some amazing environments and areas like Doctor Doom's castle and the Asgard throne room. The graphics might pose an issue for some people, but for the most part, there's plenty to adjust if you're running into problems. One major aspect of the game is the utterly overwhelming amount of particle effects, and when fighting a ton of enemies and a large group of players, you'll hardly know what's in the mess of screen shaking and flashy effects. It becomes extremely disorienting, but like other options, it can be adjusted with a slider, as low as only having your particle effects visible on screen. The game's camera is more or less completely fixed in the isometric view, and you cannot rotate the camera at all. The community is pretty split on whether or not this is a good or bad idea. You can zoom in or out if you wish, but that's about it. Cutscenes are presented in one of three ways. Fully rendered CGI, during which the frame rate seems to lock at 24 FPS. Fully animated cartoons, which only seem to appear in the opening cutscene. And for most of the scenes, motion comic style, which is crisp and quite well done. But once you've seen them, you'll have little reason not to skip them. Playing for long periods of time, especially in graphics and particle intense areas like Midtown, will cause a memory leak issue that'll slow down your frame rate to a crawl after some time. I found it's simple enough to fix with a full game restart. Marvel Heroes soundtrack consists pretty heavily of intense rock music, with occasional booming orchestrations depending entirely on the setting. It's a pretty nice soundtrack to listen to, were it not for one very prominent issue. The game is loud. Very, very loud. By default, you'll hear almost nothing but gunfires and explosions. The sound effects will drown out everything else if placed at anything but the very lowest setting, so be absolutely sure to adjust this accordingly. The game features plenty of voice acting, and of course, plenty of Steve Bloom, but the overall tone of the game and its voice acting is heavily geared towards the humorous. Characters often interact with each other as they pass by, giving insight into their relationships or personal beliefs. For example, Emma Frost spends a lot of her voice clips acknowledging or discouraging the advances of most of the male characters. Most characters usually have some kind of harsh words for the Punisher's vengeful mindset and gun obsession, or Iron Man's showboating and wealth. There's even taunts and lines that you can say simply by pressing keys on the number pad. I'm like a young Ernest Borgnine! 
I'm sure your parents are very proud. Fans of Agent Coulson from the Avengers movie and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. the TV show will be glad to know that Clark Gregg voices the character in this game as well. Also, be on the lookout for a weapons vendor named Agent Stan Lee in the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier and you might get an interesting surprise. What level 7 super genius let you in here? If you're starting out around the time this video is released, you'll probably notice the title screen is currently made to reflect Marvel's most recent popular property, mimicking the most iconic image from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, except featuring the in-game models that most accurately reflect their look in the comics. Also, Groot looks terrifying. Logging in for the first time, you'll be asked to choose from a range of heroes. Originally, this list consisted of five lesser knowns, or at least less popular heroes, but that choice has been expanded. Current choices include Human Torch, Punisher, Captain America, Black Panther, Hawkeye, Luke Cage, Black Widow, Storm, Colossus, Rocket Raccoon, and Daredevil. Note that even with all the promotion of Guardians of the Galaxy, Rocket is the only one available as a starter. Star-Lord must be purchased or unlocked. Groot appears as either a summon for Rocket or as a separate purchasable team-up character, while Drax and Gamora are only available as team-ups. Am I the only person who remembers when people would get really angry if they included Rocket Raccoon in, like, anything? Like that huge stink that was raised when he was announced to be in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3? Yeah, it totally wouldn't happen now, would it? Control is similar to the Diablo games. You move by clicking around the map, clicking on a target will attack it if you're within range. If you're a ranged character, you can fire while remaining still by holding down the Shift key. Your skills, when earned, are set to left click, right click, A, S, D, F, G, and H by default and you have numerous hotbars that you can switch to. Most combat takes place in a semi-open but still instance world, taking on various hordes of enemies of varying strength, like simple weak enemies, blue aura strong enemies, yellow aura tougher enemies, and red main bosses. Defeating enemies will usually have them drop all sorts of loot, from the auto-collected credits and colored orbs of restoration and experience, to various gear pieces, which need to be retrieved manually and can be highlighted by holding down Alt. Unlike Diablo and more like Torchlight, the inventory system is a lot more straightforward, simply requiring a single space for each item. Only a few items like med kits and crafting materials can be stacked, so your inventory will fill up fast if you go around picking up every single piece of loot that drops. You'll soon find yourself playing triage with your drops, and after you're very well geared, you might not even bother picking up anything that isn't at least a purple quality. The game's areas are fairly large maps and can be easy to get lost in. The mini-map in the corner can be turned into a large translucent map that covers the screen by pressing the tab key. Getting around the world is simple enough once you unlock various fast travel points that link to various maps and hub worlds. It's entirely possible to enter a world and completely miss the fast travel point, which will only be a big deal for completionists. Keep in mind that as you complete the story mode, switching the difficulty of story mode will remove all of the travel points that you've unlocked unless you find them again or switch back to your original difficulty. The game's main focus is the story missions, which take you through various locations and scenarios in order to recover a tablet and stop Doctor Doom's ultimate plan. While Doom was originally the final boss, Asgard was recently added to the story. There you can face off against Loki, who is also a playable character. I'm certain that gets weird. While story missions are worth going through the extra power points and bonuses that you'll receive to your stats, going through the story is probably the least interesting way to level up, as it's actually pretty simple to play through if you're anywhere near the appropriate level. Along the way, you'll face off against iconic Marvel enemies and organizations, like the Hand, Hydra, the Purifiers, and the Magia, Marvel's Mafia analogs. Is that, like, weird to anyone else? In Horde Mode instances like Midtown Madness, you've got these 12-foot-tall, laser-shooting mechs and otherworldly hell-spawn demons being escorted by a guy in a suit and fedora wielding the intimidating fury of a baseball bat. Say what you want about the super scientists of AIM, the Magia have got to be the ballsiest group of the Marvel Universe. Hey yo, you see them guys flying around shooting lasers out their eyes and fighting giant spiders? Want that shit go whack their knees, boss? Bosses consist of the more iconic villains of the Marvel Universe, like Kingpin, Green Goblin, Elektra, and Bullseye, until you're facing off against the final boss, or bosses, of Doctor Doom and later Loki. Thing about the boss fights is that they are rarely mechanic based. They may have a quirk, like Green Goblin flying up on his glider to bomb the area with poison gas, or Rhino taking a charging stance to one-hit kill anyone in his path, but the major difference between boss enemies and regular enemies is that they just have a ton of health and tend to be bullet sponges. 
Even if you were about to be taken out by a well-timed Rhino Charge, or didn't whittle down the enemy's health faster than they could yours, death is pretty much an oopsie moment in Marvel Heroes. You die and you respawn, or you wait for someone to revive you. That's it. No XP removal, no penalty to currently carried cash or equipment. I noticed a small debuff that halved the amount of XP that you'd earn until you defeated 50 enemies, but that only seemed to happen when dying in certain areas and on certain difficulty levels. There are some items that will also weaken with every defeat, but that's as easy as just not equipping that particular item, or replacing it with another version if you find one. Bosses don't even regain health after you die, meaning you can technically keep face rolling them with your corpse until you win. So yeah, not much of a challenge here. Each level up grants you a few power points, which I mentioned earlier is a possible quest reward for the main story missions. You'll earn two or three power points with each level, and these can be placed into various spots of your power trees, and you'll have three trees per hero. For example, Emma Frost can focus her mental projection powers to cast long-range spells at enemies, build up her mind control to influence enemy actions, and strengthen her diamond conversion form to better provide defense and stronger melee attacks. You aren't locked into skills beyond anything but the levels they require. In other words, as long as you're high enough level, you can choose any skill on any tree, and there's plenty of guides out there that will point you to the right direction for each hero's playstyle. At level 52, you'll gain access to your long cooldown ultimate ability. For the few that haven't yet received a rework like Punisher, this ability is unlocked at level 30, but the game plans to make the level you unlock this skill 52 across the board. As examples, Emma Frost will summon a ton of illusion monsters to fight alongside you, while Hawkeye fires a volley of incendiary arrows that burn an Avengers emblem into the ground. You can slot your ultimate skill if you wish, but it's bound by default to the U key. As you play the game, you'll gain the ability to unlock new characters, either via purchase or through collecting Eternity Splinters, to unlock either specific heroes or run your chances with a random hero box. When getting a new character, everything is reset to level 1 when you switch to that new character, but your inventory is shared among all characters. You can press the T key to bring up the hero menu and swap your heroes at nearly any time, provided you're within the correct level range and have set your difficulty on that hero once you've unlocked it. There are varying equipment types in the game, as well as equipment slots that are slowly unlocked. Your five basic equipment slots vary from hero to hero. You can think of them as something like weapon, chest piece, cape, boots, and offhand, but keep in mind that that offhand or boots could be anything from a collar to a bottle of chemicals depending on who you're playing. The game will let you know what items go where when you hover over a new piece. You'll unlock access to the ring slot at level 25. At the start, you're able to equip two artifacts, which are secondary items that can boost stats, grant new abilities, and so forth. You'll later unlock two more artifact slots, one at level 45 and the last at level 55. Artifacts are not the most common of drops, but you'll find your fair share as rewards for story missions. Medals are unique items that drop solely from bosses. Each medal is named for the boss that dropped it, and the ability that medal grants likely ties to the villain that dropped it. For example, Green Goblin's medal has a chance to release poison clouds on hit. Rhino's medal grants an occasional knockdown to your movement-based abilities. Keep an eye on the stats and the medals that you equip to see what'll suit you best. Some medals can also be used for crafting recipes, so be wary of that. Relics are a somewhat recent addition that seems useless at first, granting only one health and a stat boost of some sort. However, relics can be stacked up to a thousand, so collecting them and stacking them on top of each other can greatly increase the amount of health and stats gained. The biggest issue is that there are a ton of different relics in the game, and it's unlikely that the one that you're collecting will drop as often as you'd like it to. To make matters worse, relics are one of the few items in the game that cannot be traded between players, so if you want to collect them, you have to do it legit. Uru Forged items are semi-rare drops that give a decent boost to a certain stat, but can also be enchanted with runes that grant them even more powers. You won't be seeing any of these until level 25 when they first unlock. At level 50, you'll find stronger versions that get an even better boost from those enchantments. At 35, you can unlock the Insignia slot, which allows you to represent the team that your hero fights for and grant some stats as well. The insignias you equip depend entirely on your hero's team. So, Black Widow can't wear an X-Men Insignia, but can wear an Avengers one. Cyclops could wear an X-Men Insignia, but not an Avengers one. Any hero can equip a Shield Insignia, however. The final slot, while available at any time, is the Legendary slot. Legendaries require a lot of grinding to obtain, be it Odin Marks and Asgard, or rewards from random events. They have their own experience bars and can be leveled up to grant better bonuses. Basics, rings, insignias, and medals come in various qualities, ranging from normal at white, uncommon at green, rare at blue, epic at purple, cosmic at yellow, and unique at red. Cosmic and unique items usually have a secondary function and a chance to proc certain powers depending on the gear. Both types of gear usually raise some or all of your skills by 1-3 to three points. In the case of uniques, you might find some pieces that raise the ranks of certain skill trees, even further beyond that. 
Towards your highest levels, you'll want to make sure that you're wearing nothing but cosmics or uniques. After going through the first required tutorial mission, you'll be taken to your first hub area, Avengers Tower. In hub areas, you can't use most of your powers, and you can't use most chests that would drop gear on the ground for you to retrieve, although there are some exceptions. In these hub worlds, you'll find most of the NPCs. The most important ones to focus on, though, are the crafters and the enchanters. Crafting is a misleadingly important part of the game, as it's most effectively used to upgrade existing equipment or attach more abilities to your equipment pieces. Crafting uses the various particles it'll drop while playing the game, and crafting materials can fill up your inventory fast. Early on you can make simple recipes like boosters and medkits, while later on you can use crafting to add costume cores, or even upgrade equipment pieces to higher qualities and levels. Enchanting requires use of the far rarer runes that drop from enemies. It's usually restricted to Uro Forged items, but you can place enchantments on regular gear once you reach higher levels. So how does one get these higher levels of crafting and enchanting? By use of the donation system. Donation is similar to selling the item, except what you'd have normally earned in credits, you'll get an XP towards that NPC's next level. The downside of donation is that you cannot buy back the item if you accidentally sell it. In fact, as long as you're not constantly spending credits, and early on there's really no reason you should be, it's rare that you'll ever run too low on credits as long as you're constantly picking up what credits drop from enemies. The donation system is pretty much always preferred until you've maxed both the crafter and the enchanter at their current cap of level 20. Don't worry about having to do this to every specific crafter NPC. As long as the NPC has crafter under their name, any XP donated to one will carry over to all of them. Same goes for the enchanters and the vendors. It's recommended to try to get both your crafter and your enchanter to level 10 as fast as possible, Max level your crafter first, then your enchanter. You can donate to the vendors if you want, but they don't carry nearly as important or useful of items, unless you want to get better outfits for your new characters. Donating to max level will take a massive amount of items and gear, and it's quite the grind to accomplish. However, you can gain character levels pretty fast when compared to the rest of the things that you'll need to grind for, like Eternity Splinters, Odin Marks, and everything else that will suit you better in the endgame. You level so fast, in fact, that many players opt to prestige their max level characters, resetting everything that they've earned back down to level 1. Each time you prestige a character, you gain a different color to your name, as well as access to special vendor items. As you can see, the game is very grind-focused, but if you dug the simple loot-collecting, dungeon-crawling, kill-all-the-things gameplay of the Diablo series, you might find something to enjoy here. It's a pretty simple game to jump into when you get the urge. The community at large can be a bit of a mixed bag, unfortunately. The social channel, which is the one that you'll see the most often, can be completely swamped with arguments and immaturity, and just as often it can be reserved or helpful. People will offer up their advice on how to build characters or the best ways to gain levels, just as much as they'll argue the worth of comic book movies or hurl insults back and forth. It doesn't seem like it takes all that much to set them off. Loot isn't something that you'll ever have to worry about sharing, as you'll begin to wonder if you're being greedy as you snag up all the credits and loot that drop as your party members are off fighting enemies, or running off in another direction to get to the next section. Thing is, all that loot that you're supposedly stealing from them, they can't see it. Loot tables are exclusive to each character, which means the majority of dropped gear that you'll see belongs to the character you're playing as. Even when you're partied up in groups, all visible loot belongs to you and only you. There's no need to ask someone if they need a drop that you found, unless you plan to trade it to them. There's no need to point out the drop of an Eternity Splinter, as those will drop for your party members when the time comes, and the one that you see, for all intents and purposes, does not exist to them. Basically, feel free to steal anything that falls on the floor. Go ahead and pretend you're being a greedy jerk if it makes you feel any better. Parties are limited to five players maximum, with the exception of raid conversions. Keep in mind that converting to a raid will lock your party out of some of the instant content, unless it was specifically made for that. In story mode, anyone from any player level can join your party as long as they have selected the same difficulty mode. You are level locked to content like Midtown Madness and Hollow Sims, however, so be wary of the level of whomever you bring with you. If you're running around solo or with a small party, the game will, by default, automatically match you to other solo members on occasion, dragging them into your party seemingly at random. Being in a party isn't a huge deal, so there's really no reason not to be in one unless you just feel you'd be better off alone. If you don't want to be automatically matched, there is a way to disable the system in the options menu. If you want to create a guild, which in this game is called a supergroup, it's a pretty simple process. You just need to have a manageable 10,000 credits. Once you have the cash, locate War Machine in Avengers Tower. He's on the left side of the same room as the crafter. Purchase the item from him and use it, and you can create your own supergroup. Oddly, creating it doesn't end at just using the item. 
is you have to enter the command forward slash sg create space then the name of the group that you want. It's a bit convoluted. We're grindstone because we couldn't think of anything else more clever at the time. If you want to go about the game grinding up levels quicker than just running through the story, the terminals in most hub worlds will take you to the previously mentioned Midtown Madness Endless Event area, where you can get plenty of quality loot in no time. Be sure to follow the crowd, as the events will have you facing off against several supervillains at a time, in which a small queued group will face off against wave after wave of events, increasing in difficulty until you either leave the match or fail. Finally, X-Defense will have you protecting Xavier's school from various attacks in order to protect the students unable to defend themselves. All these are fun, if not repetitive, distractions from the main story, and are much faster paced. Give them a try if you're looking for something to do with a group of friends. Marvel Heroes Cash Shop doesn't contain anything that would be seen as abnormal. There's no surprise that a game based on collecting and leveling various heroes would, of course, put those heroes up for sale, but what's interesting is the various ways that you can just circumvent having to buy them outright. You can buy new heroes through the collection of Eternity Splinters. Note that you gain these splinters at a very slow rate when compared to the amount that you'd need to unlock new heroes. Getting one splinter every 15 minutes or so seems a lot less fast when you realize that you need 200 to 600 splinters for each hero. You can also get a chance at a random hero if you purchase a cheaper random box, but you do run the risk of getting the same hero twice. People seemed happy about this change to the original system, which would just drop heroes rarely at completely random times. I was lucky enough on my original Hawkeye playthrough to get Punisher to drop under the old system. Who, of course, is now someone I could have chosen from the start. Lucky me! So, having a clearly obtainable number to work for when you get a specific hero is nice. Getting random numbers of splinters from various events can speed up the process very nicely, but the overall potential for getting heroes seems slower. At the very least, you're guaranteed to get a new hero now. One way to get these bonuses, or even some decent cash shop items, is the login rewards. You'll notice you get items each day for logging in, and unlike a lot of games of this kind of system, you don't have to log in consecutively. Skip a day? A week? A couple months? You still get the next bonus that's owed to you. The cash shop points are known as G, and vary greatly depending on what it is you're looking to buy. Even prices on heroes are vastly different. Want someone fairly unpopular and available as a starter? You're only forking over about 450. Want some super popular, loved and cosplayed by everyone iconic hero like Deadpool or Iron Man? Hand over 1350. That's actually $13.50 by the way. You can even get a massive variety of costumes for the heroes, some as jokes, some based on their movie costumes, or other Marvel universes. Some costumes are only available through bonus cards, and each costume varies greatly in price. Something a bit more useful to you might be in the form of a team-up hero, which is a summonable AI hero to fight alongside you. Of course, if you're playing as someone like Rocket Raccoon, who can summon Groot at will, or Emma Frost, who can turn nearly any enemy into an AI partner, it's slightly less important, but it's not a bad option if you're mostly flying solo. Team-up heroes even get their own sets of equipment. While things that make your play much easier, like the retcon devices to reset your skill points, or the XP and drop boosters are all available in the store, the game is very nice about granting them to you as bonuses, be it events, login rewards, or even rewards in the story missions. They aren't exactly cash shop priority. What might be the most useful item for longtime players would be the bank spaces. The stash is rather limited, especially as you start collecting runes and crafting items. General tabs cost 500G, or $5, but if you don't mind limiting yourself a bit, you can get cheaper versions of tabs, like ones that only allow you to store crafting materials for 300G, or character-specific gear tabs if you want to store gear sets that fit specific playstyles for 350. Really, New Heroes is likely where most of your spending will go in this game, so feel free to choose a favorite if they've locked you out of yours from the start. Marvel Heroes to this day continues to be a very polarizing experience for people. Those who love the game love it and play it to a very dedicated degree, while those who despise it are willing to rant about how much they hate it at a moment's notice. Since I was hearing more of the negative than the positive when I first started out, I came in pleasantly surprised and found myself enjoying it. Hell, this episode could have been ready weeks ago, but I kept finding myself jumping back into it and playing for hours on end to see what else was in store. Now I have a level 57 character to show for it. How you'll take to the game depends entirely on your love of Marvel, your love of grinding, and what you like most about the Diablo franchise. Here's my final rating. Those who adore the Marvel Universe will probably be this game's biggest draw. 
Being able to play as your favorite characters and interact as your favorite villains and enemies might be all people are looking for from a Marvel title, and this game at least delivers that. Constant roster updates with beloved characters being added all the time should keep people coming back as well. Loot Hounds will have a blast picking up and comparing the hundreds of loot items that are constantly dropping throughout the game, and those who could spend all day combing through an inventory to make sure that they're equipped as well as they possibly could be should enjoy this quite a bit. It's a very simple to play game, and very easy to drop in, play for a while, and jump out when you get the urge. The simple to grasp gameplay makes it great for those who like to grind during things like podcasts, as long as you adjust the sound so you can properly hear it. You might want to involve actual money in the game if you're the type who just needs to play as Spider-Man and would rather drop the cash than the time investment in order to finally play as him. If you do have the time to grind, you could obtain a lot of the things you might desire, so never feel pressured to have to buy someone. However, those dedicated to the game to a large degree might want to invest in some better storage space. When people wanted to see a Marvel MMO, they probably wanted more of what Champions Online eventually became, not a choose an existing hero and grind away Diablo clone. So those who wanted to create their characters and interact in a world of Marvel are completely out of luck here. While there are plenty of alternate costumes available, there's no place for original characters or creations. The game isn't really that challenging in the least. You can win nearly any fight through pure attrition, and the death penalty is practically non-existent. The reason I found it so easy to listen to other things as I played this is because at no point did I feel I really had to think about what I was doing. This lull in feeling invested comes double with the focus on the grind. Even after you're done gaining levels, there's still things like donations, eternity splinters, event items, odom marks, and dozens upon dozens of things that will have you repeating the same tasks non-stop in order to progress in strength, just slightly. Since there's little else to do but enter rooms and slaughter waves of enemies until you fight a boss, the gameplay feels very limited, and the casual playstyle is almost required just so you don't become overwhelmingly bored with the monotony. If you find yourself wishing this game had a lot more to do than just dungeon grind, you might want to avoid it altogether. Next time, I'll be looking at a recent attempt from a fairly unknown company to drop all subtlety and finally attract that audience that they've been working toward.